The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Welcome to Real Agriculture's Canola School series. I'm Kara Oosterhaus. In this episode, I talked to Leighton Blaschko of BASF. Leighton and I walk through a field that has seen some recent cutworm damage. We talk about what damage the insect can do, how to control it, when you should be spraying, et cetera, et cetera. Check out our conversation now. Yeah, typically what you, uh, when you're scouting a field, you the, some of the biggest clues for cutworms might be pa patchy nature of, uh, of the crop. So if you're looking at a field and you see some patches you, that are larger, you might, that might be an indicator of a problem that's already been going for a while. Um, the other thing that you could see is within a row, you might see you know, a number of plants, a nice a foot or two feet of, of development, and then all of a sudden a little bit of space where things are, where you're missing some plants. So you may want to look there and say, what's going on? So, Sometimes if you're lucky, you can see plants like, I think there's one over here. You can see that, uh, I, I would bet there's probably a cutworm, cutworm issue going on. They turn kind of a bluish color, purpling along the edges, and then they will be falling over. So they are not, uh, if you were to look at the base of the plant, you'll see that there's some damage. We can, if you carefully look at the plant, and if you carefully dig, sometimes you can find the cutworm there. So it's a bit of an art, it takes a bit of uh, practice. Sometimes you get really lucky, sometimes you don't. But maybe if I just dig this plant up, we can see the kind of damage that we're talking about. You can see where it's fairly thick here, sort of normal thickness, and then really, really thinned out. So this one looks like it's been kind of dying or almost dead for quite a while. It's kind of off colored already. Normal color would be a white root, kind of like this part. So it's trying to still send some nutrients and some life to the plant, but I think it's pretty much on, on its way out. So if we dig for the cutworm, sometimes you can find them right by that uh, plant that's uh, tipping over. Uh, other times you look in those patches where you're missing some plants and then you can see the just the root, but no above ground part. The wind sometimes blows them away pretty quickly. So in this particular case, I'm not seeing a cutworm yet, but it might have moved on, might have moved further down the row. Typically, cutworms uh, would be feeding at the root. They'll chew the plants off, mow them off at the uh, near the base of the, where the stem uh, goes into the soil or just below the soil surface. The holes in the leaves, that would be more indicative of uh, flea beetles. If we're talking about um, you know, how severe or what the impact of cutworms can be, you need to look at your stand and if it so happens that they're within the row and they're fairly uniformly spread out throughout the field, that's one situation. And from what I've read, there's different um, thresholds based on the species and the crop. So anywhere from one to four um, cutworm larva within a 30 centimeter or one foot of row would be a threshold for an application of an insecticide. Whereas, so that's if they're uniform throughout the field, that's what you may want to look at. The unfortunate part is quite often they're not uniform. They might be in patches. A lot of times you'll find them in on a little on the higher spots. So maybe some slower growing plants, some easier burrowing for the, for the cutworms to, to move through the soil. And uh, so that's where you might say, well, is it just a hilltop that's drier? You know, maybe pay attention that it might not just be dryness. It could be uh, cutworms causing the issue. And in those cases, when you have these patches, they can just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think, you know, you're going to lose a whole area. It might be an acre or it might be 10 acres or something like that. That could be pretty significant, not only from the crop loss, but then weeds will come in. Um, you know, maybe you're going to get a later emerging bunch of canola that might come later and really mess up your harvesting. So uh, that's when people say, you know, it's, it's too severe an, an issue and they can either patch spray or they can uh, you know make some decisions around those patches alone what you want to see is if you're if you're noticing that you don't have cutworms throughout your entire field and you can notice that you have these patches that are thinner 
the population of plants are not uh, as certainly not as much of a stand as you'd like to have you want to go out there and just spray those you know those those portions of the field and uh, treat the insects only on those portions rather than across the uh, the entire field from cutworms from what i've noticed this year is they're kind of everywhere sometimes they are uh, at the edge of the field, sometimes they're right in the middle. Uh, it, uh, to me, I wouldn't say that they're always only in a certain part of a field. They can kind of be sporadic or patchy in nature. So here's one, Kara. You know, this is a perfect example, again, where the plant is, it sticks out like a sore thumb. You know, it's off colored. That one might be a few days ago that that happened. And how do you identify them? Well, I guess because there's numbers of species, there's a lot of good guidebooks out there. But uh, one thing I read that, you know, kind of what makes a cutworm a cutworm is, you know, they will curl up into a C shape. That's one of the, I mean, there's probably other insects that do that too, but that's a, one of the indicators for it too. Uh, so that's one thing that's pretty important about controlling them is they are, they do come up during the, the night. So uh, at dusk is when uh, you would want to be typically applying uh, an insect, foliar insecticide. Um, the other thing about insecticides, there are products now that are registered that are not as uh, sensitive to, they have more residual activity, so they don't only need to be contact because the reason you would spray at night is because a lot of the products are contact in nature. Some of them are more residual in that you could spray during the day and you would still get control and they would, they would have a lasting effect. But the other thing about some insecticides is not only the synthetic pyrethroid class of, of insecticides are affected by temperature. So if you have these hot days like we're experiencing now, anything over 20, uh, 25 degrees, 28 degrees, somewhere around there, uh, they, are, they become less effective. So again, that's another good reason to spray during the night.